It's The Real News Network. I'm Greg Wilpert in Arlington, Virginia. Economies around the world are beginning to feel the massive impact that the coronavirus pandemic is having. The US stock market has collapsed to the level it was at three years ago, and jobless claims in the United States shot up by 33% relative to the previous week. In response to the crisis, governments around the world are planning economic rescue packages. For example, the Trump administration is proposing $1 trillion for which it would provide $500 billion in direct payments to households and another $500 billion in loans to businesses. Where will this money come from? How governments can deal with the economic crisis and with spending priorities more generally is an issue that a recently published book titled The Debt Delusion, Living Within Our Means and Other Fallacies proposes to address. To discuss the book, I'm joined by its author, John Weeks. He's Professor Emeritus of Development Studies at the University of London and coordinator of the London-based Progressive Economy Forum. Thanks for joining us again, John. Thank you for, for inviting me along. So I want to tie uh, your book into the recent policy proposals for dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. However, before we get into that, uh, we need to lay out some of the main arguments in your book uh, about the debt delusion. Now, your book outlines five main myths that we have to uh, have that deal with uh, debt. The first one is that we must live within our means, that governments must balance their books, we must tighten our belts, never go into debt, tax is our burden, and that there is an alternative. Now, we can't get into each one of these, but it seems to me that the first four are variants of, one of each other. Uh, about not going into debt because it could lead to economic problems. So we, before we get into uh, discussing why these, this is a myth, let's focus on why mainstream economists and many in governments argue that, uh, make that argument. Uh, why, in other words, why should governments avoid debt, according to them? Well, I think that there are, uh, there, there are several reasons given. There are technical reasons. They aren't actually technical reasons. They're ideological arguments presented as technical reason, uh, reasons. I will give an example. There is the argument that increased public debt, increased public borrowing, I forget which increased public debt, but by the public sector borrowing, that drives up interest rates, and leaves less space for the private sector to borrow. Now, uh, on, on one level, uh, that is an empirical argument. Uh, on the other level, it's an uh, ideological argument because it basically says uh, even if it's true why is it a problem maybe that's a good thing uh, so but in fact it's not true uh, the interest rates are at a historic low they've been at a historic low for 10 years they're even lower now than they were a month ago and the possibility that uh, increased government borrowing increased government deficit will reduce the private sector is uh, fanciful at best. On the contrary, the more likely outcome would be that the government's expenditure will prompt the private sector to, uh, to spend. In fact, that's exactly what the Trump administration hopes. And uh, the recent, uh, I might also mention the uh, stimulus in Europe of 1.7 uh, trillion uh, euros uh, which uh, uh, for an economy, uh, for a total economy about uh, twice the size of the United States, the um, uh, uh, though they're divided, the, it's not a aggregate um, uh, stimulus. It is one country by country. But um, I mean, another argument though is that it's unsustainable. That the debt burden will become too too uh, difficult for uh, countries to uh, for governments to eventually pay off. What's your response to that uh, that argument? Well, um, first, I think it's worth uh, uh, noting um, uh, before I get into an analytical explanation of it that um, the Financial Times of uh, uh, of London, uh, one of the leading uh, business newspapers, uh, just had a leader lead article in which it argued that the uh, not only was uh, the British debt sustainable, but more striking than that, that the Italian debt was uh, sustainable. The Italian debt is about 120% of GNP. And <clears throat> the, they made uh, the technical argument, which they, that the Financial Times knew 10 years ago when it was arguing for less debt, but the, uh, the technical argument is that servicing a debt is not determined by how big the debt is, but how much it costs to service it. And so when the 
interest rates are very close to zero, the actual cost of the interest cost of servicing and debt is uh, is quite small, quite manageable, and the, uh, the numbers vary from country to country. But in most countries, the servicing of debt is well below two percent of GNP. And I might just add to that to everyone out there who says, "Oh, two percent of GNP? Well, that's as big as you hear different things depending on the country. That's what we spend on education. That's what we spend on roads, whatever it might happen to be." That interest payment goes primarily to, in developed countries, to pension funds. Some of it, a substantial portion goes to wealthy people, but a majority of it goes to pension funds. So if there's anybody out there who has a pension who's watching, you should cheer when you hear that the government is paying more interest uh, on his debt because your pension fund is probably heavily invested in U.S. government bonds. That brings me to another issue that you bring up in your book, which is that, of course, uh, a large chunk, and you just now, in your answer just now, also kind of allude to it, a large chunk, if it's not going to the pension funds, goes to uh, other people who are wealthy, that is, the interest payments go to people who are wealthy, making them potentially more wealthy, and thereby wouldn't that increase uh, inequality in the country? In other words, if the government goes into greater debt, it essentially enables greater inequality, or is that wrong? Uh, uh, in principle, that's correct. There are, there are two points to make. One, we shouldn't exaggerate that. As I said, one of the largest, um, uh, I think the largest single source, obviously this d depends on the country. Uh, this would be true for the United States and for Britain and for Germany. It wouldn't be true for Bulgaria. Uh, but the, uh, for most uh, large countries, the uh, single largest debt hold holder of public debt are pension funds. And while people who receive pensions, uh, their, in some cases, their uh, incomes are above the average. Take the United States, the Social Security Fund is primarily uh, in public bonds. And so transfers of interest payment to the Social Security system would not make income distribution worse. Second of all, there's a problem that you can, uh, you can easily solve with higher marginal tax rates. So you can work out easily enough uh, how much of the um, government interest is going to the wealthy, say the, uh, uh, the richest 10% uh, uh, or 25%, whatever you have to choose, and begin to raise taxes along, uh, for those uh, uh, recipients uh, accordingly. We're talking about a relatively small portion of GNP, I must say, you know, if the, if the overall uh, uh, debt interest is 2% of GNP, the part going to wealthy uh, uh, portion of the population will be well below 1%, and that should be easily handled through a very uh, modest uh, increase in tax rates on the wealthy. Mm -hmm. Now, but that brings us to the fifth myth that you talk about in your book, which is that taxes are a burden. Now, this one probably feels very logical to most people. I mean, we see our gross pay on our paycheck, and we see uh, that the government takes a significant chunk out of that pay, usually between 20 and 30 percent, depending on your income tax bracket and your personal circumstances. Now, isn't this a burden to the individual? And isn't that money that we cannot spend uh, and that's, in effect, uh, taken out of circulation? Well, let me uh, say, first of all, that uh, uh, people who pay U.S. tax, and uh, even though I live in Britain, uh, I receive Social Security, so I'll pay U.S. tax. Uh, I would pay U.S. tax, but I have to say, pay uh, uh, British tax instead. There's a joint tax agreement, and the British tax uh, is about 30 percent, not uh, 20 percent. Um, now, sh should I groan about it? Let me give an example. In Britain, there's something called the National Health Service. If we didn't have the National Health Service, and that is funded by taxation, if we didn't have the National Health Service, I would have to have private health insurance. That private health insurance would be an expenditure instead of the taxation. And actually, it turns out the national health, the taxes I pay on the national health are much lower than they would be if I bought private insurance. I mean, I'm not speculating about that. I've done a little work in this area, and it is a fact. If you wanted to get private health insurance, 
in Britain for a person my age in the 70s, it would be like $1,000 a month, $1,500 a month. Now, <clears throat> for national health, I'm probably paying uh, three or four hundred uh, uh, dollars a month. Now, if they cut my national health expenditure and said, "Okay, just you've got three or four hundred dollars, go out and spend it yourself any way you want to," and well, I have to spend it on health care because I have a health issue. Would I save any money? Absolutely not. I wouldn't save any money. I would end up spending more money. And many things that we do are the same way. If you think about schools. Well, let's just give people money and let them pay for their own schools. It will be far more expensive than if the government uh, uh, paid for it. I mean, and we don't say, let's uh, let people build their own roads. I, I guess there are a few far out people on the right who do argue that, uh, but very few people do. So what you, what, a person, what you must always think when you say taxes are a burden, like how are my taxes being used? And if I didn't have the service associated with those taxes, what would it cost me? Hmm. Now, the last myth that you explore uh, in your book is uh, that there is no alternative, the TINA principle that uh, Margaret Thatcher coined. Now, this myth rather becomes, can easily become rather complicated, I would say, because there are so many alternatives one could consider. But let's focus on just one. That is the role of the central banks or of the Federal Reserve in the case of the United States. Um, that is, uh, your, to a large extent, it seems your argument in your book is uh, centered around the role that the central bank could be playing uh, in creating alternatives. Now, talk about how central banks' roles have been limited into not creating a, uh, an alternative and why that's a mistake. Uh, the first point I want to make is the important thing about uh, uh, the central bank is when a government has its own currency. So the US has the dollar, Britain has the pound, uh, the Chinese have a currency, the, the Japanese have a currency. European Union, the members of the European Union do not have their own currency. There is a common currency among them. That is the big difference. That is because of institutional reasons, and that to be this way, but because of institutional reasons, that means that the British government, the American government, uh, the uh, Japanese government can borrow from themselves. And <clears throat> the, while the, the European governments cannot borrow from themselves, they're prohibited from doing that. So when you have your own currency, you can borrow from yourself. And that means that, in effect, the, when you borrow from yourself, you pay your interest to yourself, and it's costless. In the case of the United States, the about 27% of the national debt is held by the Federal Reserve System, and another large portion is held by the uh, uh, Social Security System, as I mentioned. But, but the part held by the Federal Reserve System is just recycled back into the uh, uh, US government. So that's the first point. Second point I would make is that central banks particularly uh, the uh, Federal Reserve System, Bank of England, should be responsive to government policy. They should not be independent. That is, everyone should, as I presume you know, is those, if those organizations are truly independent, then they can make decisions which are contrary to the democratic decisions raised and passed through our Congress. So it's quite important that the role of the central bank be complementary to fiscal policy as implemented through the Congress and through the executive. Uh, my final qu question is, you know, and it seems like the uh, Federal Reserve is actually perhaps coordinating to some extent with the Trump administration, uh, and especially considering that the Trump administration has now submitted a bill uh, or proposal uh, to uh, Congress uh, for addressing the economic crisis, and the Federal Reserve would be involved, presumably, to some extent. Now, um, and uh, the rescue package is over a trillion dollars, or about a trillion dollars right now for the United States, and as you mentioned, 1.7 trillion for uh, the European Central Bank. What do you make of those proposals? Well, the, um, the, the first uh, point, you're quite right about the uh, European Central Bank 
you know, I think that the uh, uh, sum that they said is 720 billion, uh, 750 billion euro, and the 1.7 is actually a fiscal expenditure. Now, I might just say in that context, the difference between the two, I mean, a fiscal expenditure is, for example, in the uh, Trump administration, it says everybody's going to get $1,200 or everyone's going to get $2,000, whatever it happens to be, while the uh, monetary uh, stimulus comes by the uh, Federal Reserve System purchasing back U.S. government bonds, so having, it's having sold U.S. government bonds uh, to cover uh, uh, the uh, expenditure previously, uh, transfer those funds to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the U.S. government. Now it uh, buys the, those uh, bonds back, and so it purchases them with money. So, you know, Bank X uh, holds bonds, it sells the bonds to the Federal Reserve System, and the Federal Reserve System gives money to that bank. That bank then is, is hoped, will use that cash to lend out, uh, and, and in a what's called a fractional reserve system, if they got the, uh, a billion uh, uh, dollars, they can lend out a very large multiple of that. Now, that will only happen if banks find a demand for loans. If businesses don't want to borrow because the economy is depressed, then the bank money just sits idle. So much more important, well, I'm not a, certainly not opposed to the Federal Reserve System, the European Central Bank, uh, expanding uh, um, credit by purchasing bonds. We must keep in mind that it is absolutely essential to that is the fiscal response that increases the demand, the expenditure by businesses and by people, which then puts the business in a position to say, ah, we need to borrow money in order to expand uh, production. So the, the, you might say the, uh, the really important impetus here is the fiscal expansion and the monetary expansion is, you might say, permissive. Okay. Well, we're going to leave it there for now. Uh, hopefully, we'll come back to you once we have a clearer idea as to exactly how these rescue, economic rescue packages look like, and then maybe we can dig a little bit deeper as to what uh, we can expect from them and what they could be doing. But uh, we'll leave it there. I was speaking to John Weeks, Professor Emeritus of Development Studies at the University of London. Thanks again, John, for having joined us today. Thank you. And thank you for joining the Real News Network.